everybody. Um, what a nice way to open up the service with two minutes of silence and music. Um, I love this idea of your deed before creed. Um, such a great, great thing for you to embody in the work that you do um, through the Ethical Humanist Society. I love that. I wish more congregations would do that. So, um, when Pat Spencer invited me to speak, she said, please speak from a personal ethical perspective. And so I thought I would start with some stories, some personal stories. So a lot of people wonder like, okay, so how did you get involved with police reform? You know, you're an immigrant from India and how did you get involved in this movement? Um, and I am specifically involved in the mental health crisis response. So what does that mean? That means that if somebody is having an episode, um, maybe they're having a delusion or maybe they're extremely anxious, um, somebody might call 911 at home to get support or aid for them. Maybe it's somebody with schizophrenia or autism or um, any, any number of mental health crises. Um, what our organization, what our group has been trying to say is instead of having police show up at the front door, we want uh, somebody who is experienced with that same illness or somebody who has EM or somebody who, with an EMT background, somebody who can calm that person down and not trigger them even more. And so how did I get involved in that? Um, so let's see, I must have been about 12 or 13 years old. And my mom, my dad, my brother and I, we took a little trip to Brooklyn. We lived in Yonkers at the time. And my dad and my mom wanted to do this thing where he could practice crossing the, I think it was, I'm forgetting what, I'm get, well, I don't know if it was the Brooklyn Bridge or the Veras, it couldn't have been the Verrazano Bridge. Um, it was one of those bridges and he, that he had to cross for work. And my mom and my dad didn't tell me why we were doing this, but I later learned that he was suffering from anxiety, really chronic anxiety, so much so that he was afraid to cross a bridge. And so we crossed the bridge with him two or three times. My brother and I were sitting in the back and we just thought we were on some fun family trip. And then my mom said, okay, now you go by yourself. And I knew something was not right. Um, and so I, again, I was only 12 or 13 years old. And this was something that I also had to figure out how to confront as I got older within me, anxiety. And this is like on the lower end of spectrum in terms of the kinds of mental illness that people experience, right? Um, but having had that personal experience eat through my father and then via me, like my own bodily experience, I realized that even with something like anxiety, you know, that two minute of silent reflection or like doing breath work or exercising or being in the sunshine is so good. It's so therapeutic. If I were to be, say, confronted by a police officer, I would be even more anxious. Um, if I were to see triggering blue and red lights, I would be triggered even more, right? Um, so, and this is like, again, like, I think not as scary as, say, some being in the middle of a, an episode where um, I might have autism or schizophrenia. Um, so that's kind of like the personal reason for my interest in this. And I did a similar presentation, I think maybe it was a year or two ago, where I talked about this issue more from the immigrant perspective and the fact that when my dad arrived in this country, which was the early 1970s, only, what was it, five or six years prior to his arrival to the United States, civil rights activists were fighting um, for equality 
And one of the things that happened at that time was that the quotas for immigrants had expanded as a result of civil rights laws. And in 1965, that quota had expanded for South Asians. So my father, my mom, and I, my, at that time it was my brother was not born, we were able to come to this country. And so I've said this so many times before, but I feel like I also feel like I, ha I owe a debt to civil rights activists that I was, that my family and I were able to come to this country. So that's kind of like the personal story of how I got involved in this work. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you um, an overview of the kind of work that we've been doing through Long Island United to transform policing and community safety. And the Ethical Society is actually one of the organizations that has supported, it's one of the supporting organizations of their work. Um, so context slide, please. Thank you. So the work that we uh, that we did really emerged from the Black Lives Matter movement, as you all remember, um, the incident that happened with George Floyd and his murder. Um, a lot of the work that came out of in Long Island um, emerged from that movement. We all wanted a way, right, to invest to figure out a way to make better investments in education, in housing, in healthcare, in after-school programming to prevent, um, to prevent things like mental health episodes, right? Because we all know those things are triggered sometimes by things that are happening in our lives. And sometimes it's genetic. And I think in my case, for instance, it was a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Um, so we wanted this sort of attention to prevent those things from happening in the first place. Um, we were divided, we're divided into various work groups, um, data and accountability. And I was talking to Arthur about that, the importance of collecting data um, when you're working in a police department. Um, traffic, as we all know, black men are stopped at a disproportional rate compared to a lot of other communities. Why is that? Um, and then transforming crisis response, which is really a response to this mental health crisis that I've been talking about. And so we've been working for the last three to four years on this issue, Nassau County as well as Suffolk County. Um, the stories of people. So I started with the story of my father and me, and we are not black, we are not Hispanic. And so fortunately, we haven't had a lot of experiences with the police. Um, but there are too many stories about the black and brown community being stopped by police officers. And one of the things that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is Daniel's Law, which was actually named after Daniel Prude, who was killed by police in Rochester. Um, many of you have probably heard of his story, but I'm going to actually share it with you again today. Um, just give me one second so I can pull this up. So one of the things that I recently read in the press today is that police now, um, they have this name called excited delirium for people who might be having a substance abuse crisis, might be having a mental delusion. They kind of have this overarching name for it called excited delirium and police feel like they often have this license then to protect themselves no matter what. Um, and I think Daniel Prude was going through something similar. He was going through a combination of a mental health crisis as well as a substance abuse crisis. Um, so he was only 41 years old. Um, he died on March 30th, 2020, seven days after Rochester police officers detained him. They put a hood over his head, held him down, and pressed his face into the pavement. His brother had called 911, hoping that someone could help Daniel as he was in the middle of a mental health and substance abuse crisis. The medical examiner determined that the primary cause of Daniel's death was complications of asphyxia in the setting of a physical restraint. A Rochester Police Department internal examination 
found that no wrongdoing had been committed by officers. And there's actually video. I don't, again, those of you who already have issues like anxiety don't want to see something like this. It's so disturbing. But those of you who are interested in this issue, there is video footage of this and how the police officers handled it or mishandled it. Um, Daniel had been evaluated and released from a hospital hours before the fatal police encounter. So one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about is the importance of something called a crisis stabilization center. And we've been asking Nassau County to create a crisis stabilization center. Now they have stabilization centers throughout the country. In fact, Suffolk County has one. So if somebody's having a mental health crisis, instead of sending them to the hospital, a crisis stabilization center is so much more effective in calming people down, getting them the referral services that they need, getting medication, getting counseling, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of great research and evidence that this is much more effective. And in fact, one of the actions that I would love the Ethical Society to take at some point is to do some kind of a letter writing campaign to the Public Safety Committee, our Nassau County Public Safety Committee that keeps an eye on the police department, making sure that they are running ship shape. Um, I would love for us to engage in some kind of a letter writing activity to show that the data says the crisis stabilization centers are really effective. You know, um, police departments make everybody's heart race, right? Just because, you know, somebody who has a gun, um, somebody who wears a uniform, somebody who is supposed to be authority, um, triggers various responses in people who are already very sensitive and vulnerable. So crisis stabilization centers try to do the opposite which is to calm people down. Um, so that's one of the things that I hope that we will be able to do as a community, as a society. Um, so going back to Daniel Prude, um, this week is actually the week of action around legislation named after him called Daniel's Law. And um, there have been various actions, and I'm going to share with you a little bit later on the fact that Daniel's law has passed the Senate and the Assembly in New York State. And now it is going to go to the governor, Governor Hochul, and we're hoping that she's going to put it in her budget. Right now, what we're asking for is a pilot program. Ideally, we would have loved statewide implementation of this law, but we had to adjust our request, our um, request for change to start with a $2 million pilot in Rochester and Buffalo. And it looks really promising that it's going to happen. And one of the other actions I'm going to ask you to all engage in is um, basically just clicking on the link and asking Governor Hochul to support this legislation. And I'm going to talk a, a, in more detail about what this legislation asks for. Um, any questions? I know that I'm sharing a lot of information. Any questions before I continue? Um, I wanted to share another story um, about Martin Gromulet, somebody that we know who's been working with us. He's a middle-aged white attorney who spent 78 days in jail, 28 days in solitary confinement. How did it all start? His family noticed that he was behaving, he had some erratic behave, behavior. He was spending a lot of money he didn't have. Neighbors saw him throwing lounge chairs into the swimming pool and they filed a complaint. When police came to his door, he was scared. He was home alone with his three dogs and refused to open the door. Somehow, amid the mayhem, Martin had a moment of clarity. He's like, something's not wrong, something's wrong with me. So he asked the police, can you please send an ambulance? I'm not feeling well. Police confirmed his request. Instead, a SWAT team came, approached his door with a battering ram. Officers handcuffed him, and he served two months in jail before getting treatment. Now, if Martin had been taken to a crisis stabilization center, they would have figured out that he had bipolar disorder. 
but instead he spent 78 days in jail. He's in Westchester County, by the way. He's not in Long Island. Um, but he was eventually diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Today, Martin is a certified peer specialist, and he's a mental health advocate. So he got really lucky, and his story is a really good one. Um, and the reason I wanted to share his story is that in Daniel's Law, one of, the, one of the major things that we are asking is we're saying we don't want police officers to show up in a situation like this. We want peers and EMT to show up in a situation like this so that a peer and social, and social, somebody like a social worker can calm that person down. They know the techniques and a peer knows a peer knows what they've been through. So a lot of these peers are trained like clinical social workers and they know de-escalation techniques. So that's one of the key points of Daniel's Law and what we're asking for. Um, all right, so going back to the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, all right, I'm just gonna pull this up. So can we go on to the next slide, please? So I think I shared this one too. Oh yeah, this is an important statistic. Um, according to the Rudderman Foundation, half of all recent high pro police profile killings are those with disabilities, like schizophrenia, like bi bipolar disorder. Um, George Floyd, by the way, the reason, does anybody remember why the cops were called in George Floyd's case? Does anybody remember? Yeah, he used a $25 counterfeit bill, right? With at a like a like a 7-Eleven convenience store. And so 9-11, they called 911. He was also like when I saw the video, I could also tell that he was also he was also having a substance use crisis. He was very scared, he was afraid to be put into the police car. It felt like he was Again, he was he was having like this feeling of claustrophobia. Um, again, in that situation, I don't know if if um, it would be considered a mental health crisis. I was thinking that it was kind of like a mental health crisis. If somebody had calmed him down, he was unarmed, right? I think they could have managed that situation. I think he could be alive today. Um, okay, next slide. Sorry. This is just the name of our the names of our group, um, the people who've been working on these issues. Um, Claire, a lot of you know Claire DeRoche. She's the social justice coordinator at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. Um, some of you know Emily Kaufman. Some of you know Rebecca Bonanno. Emily and Rebecca, by the way, are licensed social workers. So they've been working on this issue and advocating for this legislation. Um, and Maria, some of you know Maria too. She was actually here yesterday at the ERA event. Um, so just wanted you to know who's been working on this locally. We can move on to the next slide. So Nassau County, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what's been happening in Nassau County. So, so when Governor Cuomo was still in power, he had issued this executive order that all police departments across New York reform their police departments in response to the George Floyd murder. And so we all came together and we wrote up something called the People's Plan. And we studied models throughout the country that we thought were exemplary, that were really good at preventing crisis, that were really good at preventing violent um, confrontations between the police and civilians. Um, and we also arranged a meeting with one of these great models and police commissioner Ryder. And one of these models is in MCOT, uh, sorry, in Austin, Texas, and it's called MCOT. And one of the things that they do is they still have police engagement, but if what they do is they train social workers to work with police officers when they receive the call. So then you have police and somebody who's trained in crisis to determine who to send out. And even if they don't know if a violent weapon is present or not, 
they keep the police as backup. So if they feel like it's just a mental health crisis, only the EMT and the social worker show up. And if they feel like the police are needed, police show up as backup. So we felt that we needed to, to let our Nassau County Police Department know that that is a really effective strategy that has worked not only in Austin, Texas, but it's worked in other models throughout the country. Um, next slide, please. It helped me if when you were in crisis at the social worker. Was there a question from somebody on Zoom? Okay. How, how am I doing on time, Linda? Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so this was one of the matrix. This is a matrix that actually Nassau County came up with in response to um, the executive order that was that was issued by Governor Cuomo. So we had requested something different, but we were still pleased with the fact that if somebody calls 911, and um, somebody says, you know, my brother is having an episode. He has schizophrenia. Then in that case, there's something called a mobile crisis team in Nassau County that, we, that would be deployed. As long as, and, the, and you know, the, the person on the phone would be like, yeah, there's no guns, there's no knives, the person is not violent, we don't need police, right? So they would assess that call and then in that particular case, mobile crisis team would be sent out. In situation two, where it was a little uncertain about the level of danger, police would be also sent. It would be a co-response model. So police and mental crisis team would be sent out together. In situation three, where perhaps the person might say something like, I'm gonna kill myself. Um, or that person has a gun, then police would just be sent out, not the mobile crisis team. So they're, they're, and this is all done through the call script, that, in, that first interaction, that decision is made. So this is what Nassau County said they would do. They didn't do it. Three years later, we're still at the same place. Next slide, please. Um, so this matrix that was outlined um, was informed. Oh, here's another interesting piece of information is that Commissioner Ryder and our own health commissioner, McCummings, they did a pilot study before writing up their reform plan. And they also recognized that a lot of the people that were being sent, that a lot of the people that were labeled as having a mental crisis were being sent to the hospital. And guess what? They weren't being treated well at the hospital. The hospital didn't have the resources that those people needed in order to be treated effectively. That's exactly what happened with Daniel Prude. He was like in this revolving door in the hospital. Hospital will take care of him, release him. Um, the, the, the difference is if you were sent to a crisis stabilization center, they would make sure that you would continue to refer, re, be referred to psychiatric help, medication, et cetera. Um, so Ryder, uh, Commissioner Ryder and Commissioner McCummings concluded and they agreed with these findings um, and the pilot recommended the stabilization center. Do we have a stabilization center now in Nassau County? No, we don't, we still don't. So that's what I'm hoping we can do to put pressure. Um, and I think, again, this kind of is aligned with your humanist philosophy of working with people with compassion and care and avoiding violent interactions. Next slide, please. And we do have DASH it's in Suffolk County, which is a crisis stabilization center. Um, so this is the most recent data from the um, Nassau County Police Department. They, when, when I, uh, I, I told Arthur that I've been in touch with Detective Rich Lebrun, who is actually uh, somebody who communicates with the public on their data collection. And this is the data that they shared with us. So we kept calling them 
saying, can you explain some of this data to us? You know, and like we've, we've been working on these kinds of things. So we've kind of learned how to parse it out, um, but they never called us back. We, we, so our whole thing is you need to be transparent and you need to communicate with the public so that in case something does happen, your department, it has a good relationship with the community and the community knows that they can speak to you and that they can rely on you for the resources you've created for the community. Um, but they didn't address our questions. They only shared these numbers with us. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna explain this data to you. So, basically what we looked at was that over 90% of the mentally, what they, what they would tag it as a mentally aided call, that's how, how they would describe it, over 90% of the mentally aided calls continue to be handled by police officers only. So remember they were supposed to send out mobile crisis team and police? They were only sending out police officers and we kept saying that's not a good thing. You're going to trigger people. You're going to create these escalated violent situations. And 95% of those individuals were transported to the hospital ER. This is the same thing that was happening before the reform plan was even issued. So no change. Um, next slide, please. This was actually, um, this was something that we created that we recommended to the police department and to a mobile crisis team. Again, this was based on all the research that we had done throughout the country. And we also added another tier at the very beginning. We said there are some places like Austin, Texas that they resolve some things even over the phone. There are a lot of people that call 911 sometimes because their welfare check hasn't been received or they don't have their medication. People will just call 911. So some of these issues were even resolved with something called a warm line where somebody on the phone connects you to the right person. Um, and I can share this, this graph with you if you're interested. Um, but again, a lot of this information was based on models that we studied. Next slide, please. So we looked at uh, CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon, which is a very well-known, um, uh, very known uh, crisis response system, STAR in Denver, Colorado, and MCOT, which I already told you about. Next slide, please. So again, these are the, the various models. Um, the, the, the great thing about the Denver Star model is that they even have people um, that hang out in, the, in sort of like the areas that have the most, I guess, issues with homelessness and substance abuse. So they will proactively put people out on the streets um, to check people's blood pressure, um, getting them into, uh, you know, um, homeless shelters, et cetera. It's, I feel like this is a really good model in terms of being really proactive. It doesn't necessarily force people to um, be in shelters, but it's kind of just like keeping an eye on them, keeping communication open, making sure they're okay, making sure they have access to food. I know there was that issue right in New York City where the mayor had forced people who had mental health crisis into, um, into facilities. I don't know about that. A lot, of, a lot of people that I work with at least were not happy about the forced um, this is the forced way of dealing with uh, with people in those kinds of situations because it's not really solving the problem. Again, what would solve the problem? Figuring out the homelessness, you know, providing shelter, providing um, jobs, providing treatment. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I know that I'm running out of time and I have a few minutes left, but 
This is, I think I already mentioned the Daniel's Law. We've been working on this now for the last two years. It's passed the Assembly and the Senate, this pilot program, this $2 million pilot program. And we're really excited about it. We're really hoping that the governor says yes and puts it in the budget. Um, a lot of the leading activists that have been working on this legislation are based in Rochester and Buffalo. Um, the co-sponsors, uh, Assembly Harry, Assemblyman Harry Bronson and State Senator Samra Brook are the ones that uh, initially sponsored it. And the law proposes creation of a state crisis emergency response council, the consisting of 51% peers. So remember, I was telling you the story of Martin Gromulet. So they want 51% of the folks on the council to be peers, trained peers, people who have that experience and who are trained to deal with these situations. And by the way, even though this may sound scary to some of you, there's a lot of research and evidence now about peer clinicians being the most effective in these particular encounters. I was very skeptical about it. I was like, if I were a peer, I don't know if I would feel safe going out there on my own. Um, but the evidence keeps showing us otherwise that people who are trained in these situations and have had lived experience tend to be much more effective. Alrighty, next slide, please. And I think this is the last one. I'm trying to go quickly because I know we're running low on time. Um, so the actions that you can take, I am going to share a link with you. I think David and Alice brought their laptops. I have my laptop. We're going to set them up on the table in the back. If you agree with everything that I've shared with you today, all you need to do is click on the link and send one of these form letters to Governor Hoko saying that you support Daniel's law. And this is the most critical time because she's going to have to make a decision by April 1st. What's today? March 24th. So this is like, Pat, I don't know what you were thinking, but you scheduled me right at the very right date. I don't know what it was, but you did it. And by the way, um, we spoke to Chuck Levine yesterday and he was asking questions about this. He did say that he was interested in supporting it, but he wanted more details. That's what a lot of legislators do, don't they? When they're not 100% sure, right? They're always like, well, let me get back to you. Let me do some research on this. So I guess what I'm saying to you is if you really believe that this is effective and that it will work, um, and based on the research and evidence that we've been doing, we've been very supportive of this model. Please, please, please tell your legislators to support this legislation. Um, and then the other action that we can take is some kind of a letter writing campaign that we can do for our local police department in Nassau County to offer a crisis stabilization center. Um, you can look this up. There's a lot of research on it and um, it's been shown to provide a lot of support for people, for people who are suffering. And Suffolk County, our neighbor already has it. So it's called DASH. Thank you very much. So, um, Sonia, yeah, sorry. We usually have a couple of questions afterwards, and we'll probably take them from Zoom people because the rest of us can ask you questions later on, okay? So, Joan? Any questions? Any questions um, out in Zoom land? Okay, all right. Okay, Arthur has a question. The crisis center that you are proposing, you're suggesting we write to the police department. Is the police department the or uh, the uh, bureaucracy that is going to be responsible for setting it up? Is it the uh, or something else? Is is this a political issue or is this something that really the police department could could take the initiative and uh, to to um, completion? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the answer to that question is. I hope I made this clear, but I'll, I'll make it clear now. Um, we would perhaps direct the letter to the Public Safety Committee of the legislature. 
and CC Commissioner Ryder and the person who's now in charge of the health and human safety. It used to be Commissioner McCummings, but I think she's been replaced. Um, and I can get that information. I can create a letter and we can address it to all three parties because all three parties would be responsible for making that decision. Great question. Yes. I was just wondering and looking at this, uh, whether any suggestion was ever made um, by your group or the police department itself to look at the training of police officers in handling mental health crises since uh, that's the first line. Yeah, excellent question, excellent. I don't know if you remember this, but David had invited somebody who was an expert. He was from Brooklyn College and he had done a lot of research on police reform throughout the country. I'm forgetting his name. And one of the things that he showed in his study is that even when you train police officers in de-escalation tactics, they're not very effective. Um, I am trying to remember that he was a Brooklyn College lawyer. He was a Brooklyn College guy, a scholar and a lawyer. And he, I think he, he was, he, his name was popping up all over the place right after George Floyd was murdered because a lot of people were inviting him to come and speak. And that was one of the things that emerged from his work. And by the way, I'm not crazy about body cams either. Body cams, they, we end up spending a lot of money on body cams, but they have not been shown to actually change the behavior of police officers. So, yeah. I noticed in the data you shared that some 911 calls were answered solely by the mobile crisis team. So I'm curious what exactly is the role of the mobile crisis team right now? Is it an independent uh, contact point for people besides 911 or are they in the 911 response pipeline, so to speak? Man, you guys ask really good questions. <laughs> Yeah, this is a great question. So one of the things that we were really happy about when, the, when Nassau County had issued their promises to the county, to the people, is they were gonna expand their mobile crisis team because they were like, this stuff works. And so right now, they, 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 they did hire, what was this, three years ago, they hired a lot of people we actually were in touch with one of those folks because he reached out to us and he said, I love the work that you guys are doing. Whatever you're saying is right. And he works, he, it's basically a separate nonprofit organization that works in, in collaboration with the police department and the Department of Health and Human Services. And they have their own executive director so basically what we heard was, and please don't share this with anybody. <laughs> okay, alrighty, then I won't share it. I, let me just put it this way. I've heard that it's not functioning very well as a nonprofit. That it needs, it needs a better structure and um, so it is a separate entity, but it has to work in collaboration with these two departments in terms of providing the care. So basically, if somebody calls and they only need mobile crisis, what 911 should be doing is then transferring the call to them, and then they take care of the issue, then they report the issue back to everybody, and then everybody looks at that data, disaggregates it according to how, what the outcome was. Um, there was one other question that you asked. I don't know if I answered it. Yes, yes, so they have a separate phone number. So if, if, if there's a family member, for instance, that's had a recurrent episode, like let's just say, um, somebody, you know, like I have a brother or a sister who has autism, 
and I continue to have experience, maybe I won't call 911. Maybe I'll call mobile crisis directly. Exactly. So, oh, by the way, you, you mentioned something really important, which is now we have something called 988. That was something that was um, supported across Democrat and Republican Party, it was actually signed under Donald Trump's presidency. And um, I think it was really a response to the opioid crisis, in my opinion. Um, but 988 is now, it used to be the suicide hotline. And now anybody can call 988 if there's a similar mental health crisis issue. issue. The only problem is we have nowhere to send those people locally. We don't have a crisis stabilization center. So.